Hey, Grace Talk listeners, it's Amber L.B. Swenson. I'm the host of Little Things, a Time of Grace podcast where we look at everyday issues from a biblical perspective. At the end of this podcast, I want to share with you something I think you may enjoy. I'll be back in a few minutes. How is birth control in marriage acceptable? Doesn't God say to enjoy the gift of sex and multiply? Oh, good question. Um, it's a, kind of a, a fancy term. Have you ever heard the word adiaphora before? Uh, adiaphora is a, a fancy term that it literally means something that doesn't hurt. And it's all the stuff that God doesn't command and God doesn't forbid. All right, so um, let's see. Sh- should we all play soccer? I'm very tempted to say yes. <laughs> Does God command us to play soccer? No. Does he forbid the playing of soccer as if it's sinful? No, it doesn't hurt either way. You know, you want to be careful. Things don't go to extremes, but it's called an adiaphora or something that doesn't hurt you. Um, There's a whole, whole bunch of things that are adiaphora, and this is one of them. Is there a passage that says use birth control? No. Is there any passage in the Bible that would forbid birth control in and of itself? And I'm not familiar with one. Um, There's a story in the book of Genesis about a guy named Onan who uh, the Bible says he spilled his seed on the ground and God was angry at him. Some people use that story to try to say, you see, you know, if you're not trying to bring seed to egg to procreate, you've sinned. But if you'd read the story for yourself, it's interesting and curious and a little bit uh, weird. But that is not the reason that God got mad at the man named Onan. But there's no specific Bible passage that says you can't. Does God say to enjoy the gift of sex? He does. Uh, There's not just one Bible passage, there's a whole book about it called Song of Songs. Does God say that we should multiply? Um, Only two spots in the Bible that comes up. Do you know them? God creates man and woman. First thing he says is be fruitful and multiply, Genesis 1, 28, I think. And then after the flood in Genesis 6 through 9, you know, the world has been destroyed. They have to repopulate the earth and God says to Noah that same thing. So there's not the same like push. You have to, like if you only have two kids, you're not multiplying, you're just replacing yourself, so you're sinning. Uh, Just be stretching the biblical text a little bit much. Um, The only thing a Christian does want to be careful about is because the Bible uh, does talk about life beginning at conception. Um, Go back to the abortion series that we preached. I tackled this in the the first week if you want to learn more about that. Um, Because that, there are some forms of birth control that after sperm and egg have met and a conception has happened, it will terminate the pregnancy. And so you want to be really thoughtful and really careful because there are ways to end a pregnancy even if conception has already happened. I think biblically that's crossing a line and it is something that God forbids. So check out the first abortion sermon, uh, Genesis 1. Uh, And if you want to learn more about Adiaphora, 1 Corinthians 8 through 10 and Romans 14 and 15 are the best sections in the Bible on that. Is 2 Chronicles 7, verses 13 and 14, referring to the current COVID pandemic? All right. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, 13 and 14 says this. Um, the Lord said, When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Is that passage referring to the current COVID pandemic and is the pandemic meant to bring the nations back to God? Specifically to that first question, my answer is no. Do I think that in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, uh, God was speaking to the nation of Israel and he had the COVID pandemic in mind? My answer is no, and here's why. Um, In the Old Testament, God had a special system for the people of Israel, the descendants of Abraham, where he had kind of gathered them as one special nation as his people. And he made these unique promises in the Old Testament that if they would obey him and they would follow his laws and keep his commands, he would physically and financially make them more prosperous than any other nation. Um, He had promised, if you obey me, I'm going to make sure it rains, the harvest is great, 
you're going to get pregnant when you want to. You're not going to miscarry. Like, you will, will just be above all the other nations. And when they see, like, why are your crops better than our crops? And why are your families healthier than our families? You're going to tell them, because we worship the one true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So God attached this really unique blessing to be like a magnet for all the nations. But he has not repeated that same blessing for Christians in the modern age. So do faithful Christians sometimes get sick? Do faithful Christian women sometimes miscarry? Do faithful Christians sometimes not have success in school or in business? Yes. God has not promised outward physical prosperity to his New Testament people. So do I think that that passage, which was connected to Old Testament Israel, is connected to the current COVID pandemic? My answer is no. (laughs) Second question, is the pandemic meant to bring the nations back to God? My answer is, for sure. Um, C.S. Lewis, who was a famous Christian from about 50 or 75 years ago, uh, he once said that pain is a megaphone to bring people back to God. You know, sometimes when life is good, I'm getting good grades, uh, I met the girl, oh my gosh, I got into college and a scholarship and things are going well, I'm so, my business is going up, I'm working like crazy, I'm, I'm making this money. Sometimes when life is good, it's really easy to forget about spiritual things. So God often allows, even sends, difficult times in life so we learn to think about the things that matter, the things that last forever. Um, am I prepared to rejoice if I'm broke and my sports league is closed and school isn't what I want it to be? Um, would I seek God with my whole heart if, you know, he, he lets me get sick? If this year is the year that I die, am I ready for that? So does God use all pain and suffering and specifically this pain and suffering to bring people back to God? My answer is absolutely, absolutely. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul talks about pain and suffering as a way that keeps people reliant on God, his grace, and his power. Is porn harmful even when a married couple watches it together? Ooh, yes. Thank you for asking this. Um, um, If you don't know, we talk about porn a lot in church because a lot of people talk to me about porn. So, out of every hundred counseling cases I do, I don't exaggerate, but 40% of them have a connection to pornography. So something that um, the sons and daughters of God right here are dealing with and struggling with. Um, I always ask on premarital surveys, like just blunt questions, how many times have you looked at porn in the last 30 days? And lots and lots of young Christians at our church, male and female, young and old, it's just a thing. And so the question is, is porn harmful, Uh, my quick answer to that question is absolutely yes for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says, Do not be deceived. The sexually immoral will not inherit the kingdom of God. So when, when we turn to pornography for pleasure or for relief or for entertainment, Instead of turning to God with our stress and our loneliness, like we are making sexual immorality our idol that we love more than God himself. So is it harmful? More than anything to your relationship with God, yes. Jesus said, if you're looking lustfully at a person, it would be better to like chop off your hand and pluck out your eye because God hates, he hates the objectification of the bodies he made that much. Ooh, and that's only one thing on the list. Um, do you know what pornography does, it is as addicting as heroin or cocaine is. Except it's free and you can use it almost any time and no one has to know. So I'm actually the chairman of a ministry that tries to help Christians who are struggling with pornography. And what happens in your brain when you combine like pornography with sexual stimulation is almost instantly addicting. And that's why it's such a struggle for people at our church. Much of porn, they never tell you this up front, but it's connected to the sex trafficking industry. Um, I know someone at our church who got blackmailed through porn and pictures and lost thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, I've seen couples be really damaged. Like she, she catches him looking at porn and now she doesn't feel loved 
or respected. She has to compete with these surgically enhanced bodies, on the, all of them on the internet. Like, what is she supposed to do? So she feels unloved and dishonored. So is porn harmful? Categorically, yes. Follow-up question, even when a married couple watches it together. Um, yes. Um, let me give you some just logical reasons. What happens in porn is acting. And it's fake and it's fantasy. And when a married couple turns to that, um, they're trying to compete with a, a standard that you can't compete with. Do you know a lot of young men in the age of streaming video, they, they get to college. I just read a book about this uh, called Girls and Sex. Um, you know, so many young men were just raised like porn was their sex education. And so when they actually get in a sexual situation, what they're asking, expecting, and demanding of girls is not always comfortable or pleasurable or makes them feel connected, but, but they feel like that's how it has to be because porn has shaped people that way. So the marriage bed can be soiled by the intrusion of porn. It introduces expectations and competition. You're just you know, two unique people who need to work and have fun and practice and communicate and knock it out of the park and bat a couple of singles and strike out a bunch of times and laugh when it doesn't go well. Like Sex is this beautiful thing to be cultivated and grown together. It's not going to be like porn because it's real. And sometimes you're tired and sometimes you're stressed and sometimes you have to burp when you're kissing her. <laughs> sometimes she's real. You know, anything can happen, but, but that's not porn. Porn's not real. And so it really damages good relationships. Flee from sexual immorality, 1 Corinthians 6, 18 says. Your body's a temple of the Holy Spirit, even in marriage. 2020 was a very politically... It was? It seems to have divided the country and families. How does Jesus want us to approach this issue of division and how would Jesus handle it? Okay, I'll just say it. I get really angry, really frustrated when Christian people pay more attention to their political news channel than they do the words of Jesus. Um, to me, that is so obvious. It, listen, if you're watching 15 hours of cable news a week and you're coming to church for one hour a week, you're going to end up with a problem. And when I see, I was just listening to a podcast today that says, you know, with all the media out there and all the podcasts, there are really only three ways to rise above all the noise and get popular. You, know, you could be really funny you could be really snarky or you can be really angry. And so what rises to the top of most news media? Snarky, angry political commentary. Good and evil, heroes and villains. We're the good people and they're the bad people. If we could just get our people with all the power in America, heaven would come down to earth. And that is so, that is so far from the biblical truths but man, I, I see people all the time who are still saying their prayers and they're coming to church and they're not gentle and they're not faithful, they're not kind, they're not loving, they're not peaceful, they're angry, they're frustrated. Um, I spoke with a, a woman from our church not that long ago and I said, you need to cut your cable and you need to log off of Facebook and you need to pick up your Bible, you're welcome. All right, so, all right, we got one. Everyone else is quiet, but thank you for that. <laughs> no, but, but this really is true. Um, Christianity in America has been married with a political party in many people's eyes. And, and we don't want to jump on any train or ship that might represent Jesus well or might not. Okay? Like, we're on Team Jesus. And Jesus calls out both... You know, like, what did Jesus stand for? Conservative sexual ethics and generous love for the poor. Generally in America, one party is for this and one party is for that. Jesus comes after both. And he says, no, sex is for the marriage bed, no exceptions, a man and a woman. And sell everything you have and give to the poor if someone in your life is in need. Only Jesus will tell you that. All right. So, faith comes from hearing the message. Make sure you're hearing the right message. 
If a person never heard about Jesus and therefore doesn't believe in him, do they go to hell? I think Jesus' answer is yes. Yes. Um, just logically think about this. If, uh, if never hearing the gospel would give you a free ticket to heaven, why would we ever share the gospel? Jesus said, preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. Mark 16, 16, I believe. Why would he even say that if everyone in that continent or country or in that jungle, like why would we do the hard work of mission work and why would we go at all to make disciples if just not telling anyone would end up in the same spot <laughs> as telling people and saving some of them? Right, logically it does not make much sense. Um, this tends to bother people a lot, and I think here's why. Because in modern America, we think that unless someone is like Hitler or a child abuser, they really should go to heaven. Right? Those poor people, they've never done anything wrong, right? They haven't heard the gospel yet. From God's holy perspective, all have sinned. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. What everyone deserves from God is not to be in his presence, because even people who haven't heard the gospel have done things against their own conscience that they know is wicked. Um, Romans chapter 1 and chapter 2 talks about this a lot. So if this question really bothers you, start there. And here's what I'd say. If my answer super duper bothers you, then go talk about Jesus. All right, like, I have all the patience in the world for an honest question. But if you haven't shared the gospel with anyone this week, you, you really don't care about people's eternity that much. Right? So, share the gospel. I heard some math once that if I was the only person of the 7 billion people on earth that knew about Jesus, and on day one, I told the two of you, and then on day two, the three of us each told two people, um, do you know how many, how many, just two people a day, how long it would take to tell all 7 billion human beings on the planet? I think it's 22 days. Days. <laughs> Not centuries. Days. Like, two people a day and seven billion could hear about Jesus. So, the problem is not God. The problem is we've maybe lost our passion for eternal things. So, Jesus said, go. Make disciples. Be wise. Love people. Give to the poor. Let your light shine. Heaven and hell is on the line and people need to hear the good news that saves them. Hey, it's Amber again. I'm so glad you stuck around. On my podcast, Little Things, we talk about little ways we can know and love God more. During the month of February, I'm going to focus on just one topic, love, specifically when love seems impossible. We'll talk about loving our enemies, our spouse and children during difficult seasons, and even loving ourselves. I hope you'll join me for Little Things. Just search Little Things on your favorite podcast app.